This talk is intended to just draw out some particulars uh, that hopefully, and so maybe a little less discussion than I'd like to have, but uh, again, just for the sake of being able to, to get through all this. Um, we want to know how do we, you know, so I talked about those skills, knowledge, and attitude, and uh, your talk was, I think, a great example of how you've put that together into a package, uh, you know, that's intense, that's short, uh, that, that gets across the, you know, the uh, these basic principles uh, and, and does so in a way that really takes into account the individual needs and the, the, the importance of personalizing everything that's done. So how do you how do you do that is the question. So I'm going to give you some uh, ideas because not every environment is like your environment. You've worked a long time to build that environment, yes. right? It didn't happen overnight. It took a while to get to that. So what this is, I'm, I hope my talk will do is sort of peel the onion a little bit and think to what were the core things that allowed you to get where you are now? Because uh, I, I, I think that's what these principles do. You thought through these things consciously or not uh, that allowed you to build sort of a training environment. So what are those? So first is, is building that environment that in, in which training occurs. And people don't think about the trainer needing to be ready, right? When you, the, you go into surgery for the first time, you're all you know, intense and want to make sure everything's right and you look at all the instruments as the surgeon. Yes. But the instructor maybe can be very cavalier about the whole thing. They're thinking this is not my, you know, this, I'm not the surgeon. When in fact, they're very much involved in the surgery too. So be sure to prepare yourself for surgery. Prepare the setting. There's, there's, there's several categories here. Uh, you know, prepare yourself, prepare the setting that you're gonna be. Your, your setting is just is terrific for doing, uh, doing this training that you do. Uh, I think the ship, uh, the environment where I work on Mercy Ships, two laboratories, they look almost identical to your room, <laughs> interestingly enough. You know, it's got the video monitor, uh, you know, and the microscope with the teaching head on the microscope. Uh, and there's room for the instructor to actually sit next to, you know, so, uh, you know, all those things are part of creating an, a setting that is appropriate for training. And then uh, learn to prepare the trainee. You know that uh, these things that you talked about, uh, you ask them some questions. That I, that I, gets them thinking, doesn't it? Not just you, yes. but it starts them down a path. <laughs> You're actually preparing them to learn. So I do the same thing. I ask them questions. I think about what your past experience been like, uh, and so on, to uh, to help the trainee kind of get their mindset. Um, I try to do things that help them get rid of the defensiveness, because uh, that you use. I think very effectively you use humor. Yes. That's a very important tool, actually. Uh, I try to do that same. I'm not naturally very funny, so it's not a natural thing for me, unfortunately, but I, uh, but I, I try to use those types of things to, to disarm people, because they, they come in you know, realizing they're in a vulnerable position. You know, they're gonna open the kimono, so to speak, and do their first cases with you, and you know, they want it to look great, even though they've only done none. You know, they want to do their first crate grade. It's not going to be that way. So uh, help the trainee overcome those things and finally prepare the patient. Uh, so you didn't mention that in your case, but I'm sure uh, you do this too. The patient knows that there's more than one surgeon there. No, they know. They know. Uh, yes, that's, I'm sure you did. That's, you didn't mention it, but I would just be sure to, as far as preparing the learning environment, it's, it's not just you, the trainer, and the trainee, and the setting, it's also the patient, because it may take longer. So be sure that they've had a chance to go to the toilet before they come into the operating room, not you know 30 minutes ago or something like that. We have a team be behind us, uh, you know, I don't exactly. run the patient, I don't prepare the patient, I just go to sit and do the surgery. Yeah. I don't block patient. I have a technician to block my patient. I train. I took my time to train the technician exactly. to, to do uh, the block. I so have uh, people that put the drops before to go there, and they prepare. They yeah. go to the to the uh, to the restroom and everything because bec I am just the eye doctor. I need a lot of help to be more of efficient. Course. Of course, and the, and, the, and it, all of this brings the the training environment optimizes the training environment so patients aren't you know, uh, worried about what's happening either. They need to know what's happening too. So I can go and go into these in a little more detail, 
as far as preparing yourself, learn to understand your training situation. And when you go into a lot of different places, not so much for you, because yours is the same. You built your training yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah. It's the same every single time, but not you, mm -hmm. uh, right? And you too, you, and you, you'll be in different, different situations all the time. And me too, uh, when I'm on the ship, now that one I built, that's, so yeah, that's the same all the time. But I work in a lot of different places. And so every single time I need to know what that training situation is gonna be like. And for me, I've actually established some criteria. I just won't go if it's not to a certain level because I know it's gonna be just frustrating or I believe it will be frustrating anyway. Uh, so know what the proper etiquette is and the, who the key players are and what the previous training experience have been at that location and so on, what equipment is really there and whether or not it's working or not. I actually have developed a checklist. It's a three page checklist that said, if you want me to come, I need you to complete this checklist. And in that are things like, does the fiber optic cable actually work, you know? So, and uh, you know, do you have a training scope or don't you have a training scope? And it's nothing, if, if you don't have one, that's fine, I understand. But it may be not the optimal situation for me to do what I do, you see? So I use it as a way not to, you know, make someone feel bad about what they have, but just to say, Look, I know what I have to offer you, and I know the best things I have to, to do that. And I just want you to get the most out of this, that's all. And so I help them understand that using just a checklist. I have a checklist to do that. Um, even things like understanding what, uh, uh, an, what the, an institution means by sterile technique, all over the board. So I went to one place and they said, well, we, I said, well, yes, we use sterile technique. I, said, uh, I was noticing that they use the instruments for five patients and then they sterilize them. And their, their definition of sterile technique was, well, it's, you know, it's five times around. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's five <laughs> times around and then sterilize it again. And that's what sterile technique means. So they have, you know, often all over the board. So you, and you need to be cognizant of that because you're responsible in some ways. Which IOLs are there and which ones they use? So, you know, you have a basic plan. And in my case, I use a checklist. But then you, you're prepared to adjust. Like you said, you personalize always. And when you go into a lot of different places like you do, uh, I think there's a lot of adjustment that needs to be made. But if you think through, take the time to think through what are the bottom lines uh, that you just, in your heart of hearts, you believe these are the things we just really need for this to make sense for us to do. And draw that line, you know, and say that, sorry, that's where our line is. Um, maybe there's some, maybe there's some good to doing that, you know, rather than just, well, we'll do what we can and then, you know, everybody goes away kind of, well, I don't know what that was about, but, you know, so, uh, and I've done it both ways. And so I'm, I'm now more in the draw the line yeah, place. Uh, preparing the, opt uh, opt uh, the operating room, what do I mean by that? Well, it's the pre optimizing the situation for training. So when, the, when you sit down with, the, in, with your trainee, make sure that you take time to actually make sure the equipment is adjusted for what you're going to try to do. Uh, I see that over and over again too, right? So I didn't, it's it's like I send, you, I send the doctor half an hour <laughs> before to start the surgery that's perfect. with the with our surgical uh, technique, and uh -huh. she it is it, fun, but our table is go up and down, but we have two different systems. They have to learn what it, even the 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 stool, they go, go yeah. up and, and down. The microscope, one microscope you have to push twice. Uh, see, it's <laughs> a stupid issue, but. It's better, it, you know, because you want this more smooth training for, for the dog. Yeah, so you're training them on the equipment before you start training them on the eye. That's what you're doing. And I do the same things. So that's what I mean. So you, you learn how to adjust things to check the instruments for quality and consistency and, and learn what, you know, you might need to say before you ever start. No, I don't. I really do want the new blades. <laughs> you know, like we were talking, like Gene was talking about earlier. Because I went to Swaziland. In fact, I helped them build that little surgical table that they you saw in the pictures she showed this morning uh, they had no surgical table they had put them in the chair and i thought you know, what am i going to do with that and so the the guy had the welding you know welding welder gun and he you know we got out there and built us a, a little stretcher and then they started bringing in these uh simcoe cannulas that apparently had been used a number of times somehow or they got them from some you know reject supply thing and none of them worked so I said, well, you know, we're, we're just can't, we can't go forward. This is not a, a, a situation that's workable. So, you know, those were some of the lessons I learned. So I'm all the way to Swaziland and I have the possibility of not being able to do anything. Well, 
<laughs> you know, why did I even do that? Well, it's, I just, I always assume things are going to be a certain way. So this checklist idea really made a big difference. Uh, make adjustments so that you, you know, because you get it, you put yourself in a place as a trainer where you can be there for the long term, right? If you're perched on the edge of your chair, you know, leaning over because you can't quite reach it and then it takes 30 minutes later, you can't hardly move. Well, you know, <laughs> that's not good. You need to situate yourself because you know it's going to take a while and you need to still have the ability yeah, to use to, uh, to, to do the delicate maneuvers just like you would if you're seated seated at the patients uh, as the main surgeon uh, so I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you as a trainer you know to be ready um, uh, by, by getting yourself comfortable just like you would in front of the microscope because that's what gives you the ability to do those delicate movements is if you're uh, if you're relaxed able to be relaxed uh, the scrub tech don't forget they are your friend or your enemy and um, you know, many times I've, I've been able to connect, uh, now I purposefully do that, connect with the scrub tech because they're going to need to actually assist me to assist them, right? They, I, I will need to know how to talk about the instrument. So what do you call that? And what do you call this? And in cross-cultural situations, that can be very weird and wonderful sometimes what those instruments are. So I always pay attention to that. Um, and don't forget to use long-acting local <laughs> aesthetics, not the short-acting ones, uh, you know, because it's probably going to take a while, and that's okay. So just be prepared for that. Don't think you're going to get away with short-acting anesthetics. One other little pearl is to just apply the drape yourself. Um, you may remember, and it, it used to make you a little crazy, actually, if I remember, I'm trying to remember some of that to draw on that experience a bit. When it, you kept wanting to put the drape on, and I wouldn't let you put the drape on. Do you remember that? Because <laughs> it was like, well, I could put the, at least put the drape on. You know, it's like I know I don't know how to do M6, but it was, well, there was actually a point to that, and that is, one of the difficult things is in a long case, if the drape starts is always coming loose, and you're always fighting with the drape, it distracts from the real training objective. There, it's to learn the surgery, not to how, how to deal with the small details. <laughs> yes, small the details. small the details. Like, Yes, or they, yes, so they need to be covered. So, you know, uh, pay attention to those little, th little things and make sure that the operative times are appropriate for the situation. You said five cases for you, that experienced surgeon to do because you knew that it would take a long time and he would be very tired at the end of that time. So you didn't schedule 40 cases for him, you know. No, <laughs> so, no, no. so be sure it's appropriate. The times that you set are appropriate. Uh, then to preparing the trainee, this verbal rehearsal idea. So I do it while I'm scrubbing with them. I use that time while I'm standing at the sink to talk over things. Just go over with me in your, you know, just close your eyes and go over with me while you're scrubbing in your mind what you're going to do, I'll say, something like that. And get them to do a verbal rehearsal. Uh, and if they're not quite ready to do that yet, then I say, let me talk through it with you. I'll just let me just talk through what's going to do. Just go, let me just describe what I'm doing, sort of scrubbing and talking through the thing. Uh, it's a great opportunity to do things, and they get to know the basic plan that way. They also start to hear your attitude. Then you know they, they, that the, the barriers start to come down a little bit when you when you take those opportunities like that. I find, uh, and they start to understand that about your perspective on the patients, and that you really are there for this. It's not about my ego. I get nothing out of this. You know what I get out of this. My what makes me excited is when I see you become successful. That's what's fun for me. So um, when they start to hear that, then it, the, the walls start to come down. The positive tone, like you, uh, Dr. I may ex express, you know, stay positive in your communication uh, and, and find the right words in the cross-cultural settings. Very difficult to do sometimes is certain words mean not what you think, you know. Um, um, so you just have to find, take the time to find that. Um, and then learn to ask questions about the experiences that they've had. Don't forget to kind of watch the time. As the day gets long, you might need to um, just, you know, but I think this is the learning curve, you know, now the learning is going down. You're not learning anymore. You're just trying to gut it out here. And there is no point in that. You're here to learn. I'm here to teach. Let me just do these last few cases and we'll be done for the day. And then we'll have time to talk. So that's what I do if it takes a long time. Uh, so preparing the patient, make sure you choose the right ones. You may have to do that. They may not know what to look for, so you might have to choose the patient. And avoid the excess complaints. Same thing that you said. And let them know that they have two surgeons, not just one. And, let, and just reassure them about their safety and success as your, your uh, uh, top priority. 
Um, so these things come together, preparing yourself to be focused on the training uh, steps, preparing the setting to minimize the distractions, and preparing the trainees to be rece receptive uh, to what you have to say. And lastly, the patients so that they help them with their ability to lie still and to be quiet and you know, let them know if they have a problem that, no, you're not just talking to the doctor, you will hear what they're saying. And yes, you are, it is important what they have to say if there's a problem. So a few practical tips uh, then to wrap up here for this morning, uh, learn to study your trainee. I like to say it that way, you know, that in the, the, and you describe the same thing. I just say it a little differently. I study the trainee. I want to know, I, I do it by having a little dinner with them the night before we do our training. I watch how they hold their, their um, utensils. The, the, the spoon, the fork. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So if they hold their knife like this, uh, you know, they're likely they have a certain way of thinking about how they do things mechanically. Um, and I see this frequently with the uh, African surgeons, actually. Uh, sometimes really big hands, uh, and they're, they, the, the idea of using their fingertips is a pretty foreign idea to them. They want to use their hand, not their fingertips. Uh, so you can see that in how they hold their, their, their uh, the, what they, how they eat. Um, you can hear their attitudes over, over dinner sometimes. So I just find that a good way. Watch how they breathe. Look at their posture. Not just you. Just you emphasize. You watch their hands. Uh, and and you, you watch other things too. I know you do. You watch if they're if they're sitting at the microscope like this, you know, then you, you, their hands may look fine, but they they're stressed out completely. Or they, you, I watch people hold their breath. You know, they go, and they're doing some task, holding their breath. Well, that is terribly counterproductive. You know, so I, I'll say, well, just sit back for a second. I want you to learn learn something here. I just want you to to irrigate the eye, and I want you to just breathe while you're irrigating the eye. Uh, you know, it's, 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 I know this is silly, just bear with me, and they, you know, so they, oh, I see what I was doing. They don't realize that they're holding their breath to do these things uh, sometimes. Um, and um, uh, watch for how they interact with the eye, you know, the mechanics of how they interact. Watch that. Uh, watch for cues about how they think. You know, what comments do they make? Pay attention. To what your trainees are saying under their breath. <laughs> that may be very helpful to understand what's going on in their head, more so than a formal answer to a question. So I'm all the time listening very carefully. Understand uh, their understanding of when you redirect them to do something a little different, how do they interpret that? Uh, you know, do they take that as, oh, th you know, that's good. I see how I can do this better. Is it more resistance and reluctance? And, uh, and that tells you something about their mindset. And maybe some things you need to do differently to get past that, to help them overcome those challenges. And what is their focus of attention under the microscope? Uh, some people will zoom up very high magnification. They think that makes them a better surgeon or makes it more accurate. In fact, it makes them less accurate because now they've lost depth of field. Yeah. And also, and also They've lost the, perspective. The, yes, and all the feel of, uh, of So all of they, <laughs> they see the tip of their instrument, and that's about it. And that is very bad. And, and uh, so kind of pay attention to what they're focused on. The, uh, the, the good M6 surgeons, I find, have a broad perspective about th that surgical field. They can see what's happening around the whole surgical field, not just where their instruments are. But it takes some practice and sometimes call that to their attention. Your trainees watch for cues about the, their skills, how they hold the instruments, their awareness of a specific task and how their, how their movements flow, not just how their individual in, hands look, but how things flow also I find very has, helpful. Whether they have this idea of being intentional. So here's the typical thing. They get to something that's not going well and, and the, suddenly the eye will be irrigated and then irrigated again and then irrigated again, <laughs> he's stuck. and then irrigated he's again, stuck. he's stuck. And so he's, he's doing something. <laughs> no, you know, you know, but you know, so, you know I ask. <laughs> so I, I always say, remember, I am here, here to help you. Yep. If you are tired or you have some problem, I can tell you what do you do, or I can do that a specific step. Sure. But that's it. And, uh, and whatever they want, they can try one more time or 
or and then uh -huh. I I interview in the in the in the process. Uh, watch for how distracted they are by things going on around them. That gives you a little clue as to their their focus. Uh, so if there's a noise in the operating room and they're you know they look away from the microscope, that tells me something that they're you know they need to learn that that uh, the ability to take those things in without letting it distract them from what's going on and. In, in M6 surgery, I find that's actually pretty important because uh, you know you're you're working with a more dynamic situation than you do. You agree that, you know, than you are with uh, phaco surgery. So well, watch for their d distractibility and then their manual dexterity, their bimanual dexterity, as you pointed out. Some not so good with the left hand. Um, that tells you a lot about the, the trainees. Watch for their their attitudes, how they interact with the team. You know, if they're if it's all about them. Uh, they, don't even, they don't even know who they're working with. You know, they just walk into the room and they could care less who the scrub tech is or any of that. You know, that, that tells you something that maybe they need us to work on some things about how they work with the team because as you said, as everyone has said, this is not a one-man show. Success with M6 is about a big team. Yes, it's a big team. And so they'll need that no matter what situation they walk into. How they lead, what they, how, they re how they relate to patients. So. You can see what I'm describing here is kind of a holistic view of your training, not just can they do that task, but a, a, a gathering data, so to speak, about how they do that task and what are the challenges that they have and what are their attitudes and so on. Uh, are there ethical issues that need to be considered? And sometimes you hear those things over the dinner table. Um, you know, do you really wish you didn't know things <laughs> that you didn't hear? And you know, so you, you know, you just need to be aware of those things. I really believe those things affect the quality of care that people deliver. Uh, that that comes from a moral framework, I believe, not from just a skill set. You know, uh, the, the ethics of medicine comes from a moral framework. And if that framework is damaged or, you know, of no consequence to somebody, I think it affects things and they need to be made aware of that. Uh, so use, uh, control the training experience, use your observations to suggest, to make suggestions and to come up with better options. Ask questions, use a dialogue to help them maintain their focus and increase their understanding. And I've described already that invisible hand idea, you know, that you're helping and they may not even know that you're helping. You know, they're focused on doing something and you just make that a little bit easier by rotating the eye down just a little bit and they don't even, you don't make a big deal about it. You just move the eye a little or, bit, or move a, a, a little bit the microscope, or putting a, a better focus because you yeah. you you are watching through the teaching. Exactly. So if this you don't have that, with the, with so the back to my soapbox. Yeah. If you don't have the microscope that you can do that with, you know, then you can't do this. You can't be the invisible hand if there's no teaching scope to do that with. But yeah. you obviously have that. That's a great thing. Uh, control the conditions to allow them to stay focused on their tasks. So. Uh, you know, your whole team that you work with as a trainer, if it's your place like yours is, your whole team is, is involved in training, yes. not just you. I, no, I no, know no, it's, it's true. It's <laughs> because remember, this, this, normally when, I, we, we, when we are not training, we are doing surgeries. Yes. And this is the same setting. Same team, yeah. So my, uh, you, I'm sure you remember, and some of the people that I worked with on the ship, uh, Glennis, I think, was still there when you were there. Was her name? She was the head nurse. And uh, Glennis was just a master at doing this because we did this together for many years. And she would come to me after, uh, at the end of the day and she'd say, you know, I just noticed a few things about that trainee. I love, love that, that now somebody who was making an observation. It's happened that, with me with yeah, my surgical yeah, yeah, they will tell you things about, about these people that you may have missed or need to consider. And so take advantage of that, you know, when you're working in an environment with a team that you know let them help you as a trainer also, not just as a surgeon is my point. Uh, so optimize the learning, ensure that patients are selected properly, um, be ready to step in and stop if the learning process is, is, is going down, you know, if there's less value from fatigue or whatever. Um, suggest alternate positions as you need to, you know, the, how they're holding something or how they're sitting up at the microscope. All these details, detail, detail, detail. detail yeah. You said practice, practice, practice. I would say detail, detail, detail. I would add to what you're detail. saying. Uh, you know, um, uh, suggest alternative techniques and stress relievers. You know, the or I, I said the one that you just sit back for a minute and irrigate the eye and just breathe a couple of times and let's just you know just get your bearings again for a minute and let me just talk to you about what's happening. Things like that can be really enhance the learning experience. I think. 
uh, use the feedback. You talked about the, the sort of the uh, the talk on day two. You talk about the first day or two. two. We we uh -huh. we we type uh, the surgeries. Yep. And if they ask, we can give you the. the sure, I saw it. Their in, surgeries. Yeah, I saw it in your video in your picture of your operating room. You've got the video yeah. system there. Uh, I think that's tremendously valuable for learning uh, from the trainees because they are. They're, they can be, once they step back from it's amazing how much more they see on the replay than they did during the operation, right? Incredible, actually. Is it, whoa, you know, that looks terrible. Well, it didn't look that way when they're doing the operation. You know, they thought everything was fine. But the, so they can be their worst critic when you let them see it. So I don't say anything oftentimes. I'll just play, well, let's just look at that. And uh, we look at that, they go, you can see their eyes kind of get bigger. They go, ooh, hmm. Yeah, okay, well, I see the problem there. Well, let me tell you what the mechanics of that are. So then I offer some supporting information that helps explain why that happens the way it happens. Uh, do the debriefing. The, make sure you use the one-day post-ops. Like you say, make, everybody has to see their post-ops because you learn a lot from that. Uh, and it's this combination of the real time during the surgery and then the post-op appearance and the debriefing that I think is really the powerful combination and why you can accomplish a lot in three days. You know, you, you, you stacked up all those tools and put it into a package that I think is really, uh, really good uh, to be able to do that. Um, again, uh, just a reminder that it, I've had at least two times I can remember over the past years, uh, there were, both were in South Africa, as a matter of fact, um, there was a, a lady that came to learn uh, M6 surgery struggled and just and and really was doing potential for a lot of harm so I, I just set her to the side one day I said um, so what is your your mindset about about what you love to do the most and she went into this discussion I said what if I said to you that would be a far better thing for you to do than than trying to force yourself into this surgery mode what do you think about that and, uh, and you know she was it was a sort of a funny reaction because she was like relieved it was like, oh, thank God, thank I didn't God. want to do this anymore. You know, it was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. But somehow she felt compelled that she had to do this. Yes. And as the trainer, in some situations, you have a lot of power to be able to release people from this feeling of obligation that they have to achieve something. They don't have to do those things. And so just be ready. Sometimes it's better to say, um, you know, this this may just maybe consider it. Maybe this isn't your cup of tea to do this uh, for the long haul. And then we've already talked about those. That, well, maybe you didn't meet the objectives we had for this training segment. So just be aware. Maybe you're not ready yet to work on your own. Be ready to say you're not ready yet. <laughs> you need some more training. Be ready to say that too before you said. So you you said well you know or maybe it was Gene said you know they you send them to him and he'll say thumbs up thumbs down or no, something like also that. Also I send a report to see international yeah, maybe, every time maybe, when I get yeah. doctor and I and I, I am not God but I said you know he's not ready to go by himself. Yeah. Yeah. There's sort of a he sense. He need a second train. That. Yeah. Or he have to to start all over again because she's sure. not ready. And there's there's it's lots of time. Yeah. And there's lots of factors so you know there's it's, yeah, we don't know yeah so you know it's sometimes hard to say but sometimes it's pretty clear and in those cases it's just a, a, an encouragement to be uh, ready to do that um, so the, the big challenge for us is what to do in those those cases you know these these first two to three hundred cases that people are learning and uh, as I mentioned I do hope that's where simulation will will fit in uh, don't forget that FACO surgeons are experienced with tunnel dissections but will really have trouble with managing the anterior chamber because they're used to that small tunnel and the well-formed chamber and the whole dancing, yeah, is... is this is the reason yeah. I start for the end of the procedure. Mm -hmm. How to use the Cinco cannula. Yeah. Or remind them how to use the Cinco cannula. Exactly. Uh, don't forget that extracapsular surgeries are typically the ones I've found anyway that have the bad habits because they're the ones typically who learn from a book or never had any formal training uh, a lot of times uh, and you know they've gotten away with a lot of things basically so uh, they in those cases you're not just helping them to learn new habits you're learning them to unlearn yes. bad habits that's much harder to do don't forget that uh, and extracapsular surgeons, a lot of times in these environments, my experience is 
they think a bad result. Well, that's great. I got the cataract out. <laughs> you know, what What are you moaning about that I didn't get a good result? I got 15 stitches. <laughs> yes, what do you mean it's not a good result? I mean, it's unbelievable to me that, you know, in these day, this day and time, they'd be happy with a hazy, you know, a terribly hazy cornea or putting in 10 stitches or whatever and think that's a good result. But that's the attitude that they come into it with sometimes. So it takes a while to overcome some of that. Uh, focus on the greatest challenges, enhance the existing skills, the same things you said, uh, plan appropriate training time and number of cases, and practice all these training techniques, these SKAs that we talked about. Uh, and I believe that uh, this all is based on the idea that I think that competency is the best road to mastery. So it's, it's like you don't learn bad things, you start learning the good things so that then those can be reinforced because it's very hard to undo the bad things. Um, so tailored around the previous experience, just like uh, like uh, you said, and make your make it purposeful. And uh, I would love, uh, you know, M6 is still one of those procedures that because there's not much money in it, there's not a lot of study of it either. <laughs> and uh, isn't that a shame, really? Shame on us that you know we won't study it because well, it doesn't really matter is sort of the attitude, because you know it's not the procedure that makes a lot of money. Well, what if we actually took more care to study what we're doing? What are some of the best techniques to use? And what is the best way to train and all of those things? No one's asking those questions at this point that I can tell. And I think that's a shame. So uh, again, just kind of think about your aptitude and your calling. And, and uh, I believe seeing it passed on is, is well worth it. So the guy sitting on the, the right there was a fellow that I trained, uh, Chibani Tuswa. He's from South Africa, uh, South Africa. And he's now training... He's now the cataract uh, surgeon at Bloemfontein, which is one of the main cataract centers in South Africa. Uh, and it's because he learned M6. Uh, so he was a tribal guy. I mean, he came in with face paint, for goodness sakes. And you know, it's like, uh, okay, well, you know. So now he's the head of that section at Bloemfontein. Just astonishing to me um, what, what can be done sometimes. So um, that's it for me, and uh, I think we're still probably could get some lunch. Thank you all very much. For